This video will discuss vectors in linear algebra. So starting with this uh, video and those in the rest of this chapter, we're starting to get into some of the more advanced topics, which aren't essential for success in physical chemistry. But um, some of these videos, uh, depending on how intense your professor is, uh, some of the basic elements of these videos might be helpful to you in your class. But otherwise, these are primarily included um, because they're necessary for studying the computational chemistry playlist, which uh, as of the filming of this video is still in progress. Okay, so we'll start out by defining a scalar quantity. That would be some mathematical quantity that only has a magnitude. So that would be things like real numbers, like you know, e or pi or 1, 0, negative 1, things that only have a magnitude. Whereas a vector is something that has a magnitude and a direction. So we could represent a vector a. We might have a uh, kind of half arrow head on top of it. We might indicate it by a single uh, line underneath of it. Um, this is what I would call a rank 1 tensor. Uh, I don't talk about tensors too much, but um, tensor just meaning kind of like a, a scalar would be what I call a rank 0 tensor. A vector is what I call a rank 1 tensor. A matrix would be a rank 2. So a vector here, uh, one underline because it has one kind of dimension of, of entries. Might also indicate it by a boldface letter, although sometimes hard to indicate boldface when I'm just freehand drawing these, so not too much in that case. But most commonly, what I could represent it as is a um, some coefficient times a set of basis vectors. So things like in three dimensions, x, y, and z, we have this idea of what the x, y, and z axes are. So I could say that the x-axis, there's a what I call a unit vector in the plus x-axis. It has a magnitude of 1, and it points in this direction. Same thing in y, same thing as in z. All of those we're used to in terms of being 90 degree angles away from each other. So I could say this much times the x uh, unit vector plus this much times the y unit vector plus that much times the z unit vector. That overall giving us uh, what I could write as a column vector here where I'm assuming that each of these is being multiplied by some unit vector and then I can just represent the vector as the set of the coefficients that I'm multiplying by. So this would be like something where if I had this vector a, which was had at some Cartesian point relative to the origin, then I'd have the x, y, and z coordinates of it, of its endpoint there as the components of this vector. Assuming the, the head of the vector was at that point and the tail uh, stopped at the origin, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so as I mentioned here in three dimensions, we have three basis vectors. They have what you would call unit length. Their magnitude is 1, and their direction is each of the uh, individual axes in Cartesian space. And they are what we would call orthogonal to one another. So if I add magnitude in the x direction, that doesn't affect the y direction. If I add magnitude in the y direction, that doesn't affect the z. If I add magnitude in the z, that doesn't affect the x. These are all independent directions from one another. So orthogonal is sort of a synonym for independent in the sense of vectors. Okay, so that's three dimensions. We're all used to thinking of dimensions in terms of two dim uh, vectors in two dimensions or three dimensions. But now we're going to start generalizing to an arbitrary number of dimensions, things where I have n dimensions, n being the number of dimensions. So in general, we have some vector, which I'd have n unit vectors, and I could represent as this column vector of n elements. So I have a1, a2, a3, a4, all the way down to a sub n, where n is some number. And since this is quantum mechanics that we're generally going to be applying this to, we can say that these, uh, these numbers here are scalar numbers, but they in general can be complex. So they can have both a real and imaginary part in the most general case. Most of the time we'll work with real numbers, but in the most general case they can be complex. Okay, so the first property of vectors that will be of interest to us will be a dot product.
You might have studied dot product if you've taken a multivariable calculus course. So A dot B would be the notation of this. And that would just be a sum over all of the elements. So sum I equals 1 to N of the element for A times the element of B. So that would be A1 times B1 plus A2 times B2 all the way down to AN times BN, summing them up as you go. Okay, and then if the dot product of two vectors is equal to zero, then we would say that A and B are orthogonal to one another. We can then get the magnitude of a given vector by taking its dot product with itself. So the sum uh, from I equals one to N, sum over all elements of AI times AI, so each uh, element squared. That is the square magnitude of our of our vector. Um, this is basically you can think of like the Pythagorean theorem in n dimensions. So that gives us that the magnitude of the vector is the sum of each of these elements squared, uh, all taken to the one half power. So the square root of each of the individual elements squared would be our magnitude. Okay, so we said x, y, and z could be thought of as the unit vectors in or basis vectors in three dimensions. So in n dimensions, we'll have all of these basis vectors, which I'll label as e hat, the little hat indicating a unit vector. So I could express my vector a as a sum over all of the elements of coefficient times basis vector. So this much in that dimension, this much in that dimension, this much in that dimension, but the generalization to uh, an arbitrary number of dimensions. All right, same thing with B. I could define B as its coefficient in each of the n dimensions as well. Then the dot product, according to this definition, would be a sum from I equals 1 to n, sum J equals 1 to n, AI times BJ of the dot product of e hat i and e hat j. If you just take these two definitions and substitute in the definition of a dot product. All right, so in order for this sum to match up to our earlier definition here, what has to be the case is that the dot product of any two of these basis vectors has to be equal to what we call in quantum mechanics the Kronecker delta. So the Kronecker delta is a lowercase Greek delta and then has two subscripts, in this case i and j. And the Kronecker delta is equal to 1 if i equals j, and it's equal to 0 if i is not equal to j. So in the case where they're not equal, it's 0. So the two basis vectors, if they are different basis vectors, are orthogonal. And alternatively, if i equals j, that's the same vector, and then of the dot product of it with itself is its magnitude squared. That's going to be 1, which means its magnitude is 1, which means this vector is what you would call normalized. It is a unit vector. It has a unit length. So putting together the fact that they are orthogonal and they are normalized, we get a set of what you would call orthonormal unit vectors. All right, so if I take the dot product of my vector A with any uh, unit vector or basis vector E, then what I get if I carry out this sum is just the coefficient in that direction. So if I want to get the coefficient for A in terms of any individual unit vector, I just need to take the dot product of A with that individual uh, basis vector. Okay, so I can do some other things with vectors. I can add them. So adding two vectors together, that element is just going to be the sum of each of the coefficients of the vector. So I just have a vector where running down the column is the sum of a1 plus b1, a2 plus b2. Each element is a sum of the elements of each of the vectors that I've added. I can multiply a vector by a scalar, so I can scale it up by some factor. So you can imagine I might go from a to 2a, double the length of that vector. I could multiply it by 1 half, negative 1 half, negative 2, any kind of scalar multiple. 
And in that case, each element is just the value alpha times the original element. I'm just multiplying each of the elements by alpha. All right, I can take what's called the transpose of that vector. So I'd go from having a column vector there to having a row vector like this. So all the elements listed in a column to all the elements listed in a row. This doesn't make much sense now why we would want to do this, but later when we show how we multiply vectors with matrices, or we could even treat this vector as a matrix, the use for this becomes apparent uh, later on. Okay, so that's just listing all of the elements in a row. Alternatively, I can take the adjoint of it, which is I take the transpose, and then I take the complex conjugate of each of the individual elements. So I explain the complex conjugate in the video on complex numbers in this math review playlist. So there I turn it from a column vector to a row vector, and then I take the complex conjugate of every individual element as I go. So another way to express the dot product would be as this kind of matrix multiplication notation, which we'll get to in a few videos, of the transpose of A times B, or I might express um, the I might express the dot product of B and A star, dot product of B and the complex conjugate of A as the adjoint of A times B. So those are some of the basic properties of vectors, uh, except for the first couple parts of this video starting to get into some more advanced topics, which will continue into properties of matrices and some other advanced math uh, necessary for us to discuss computational chemistry in some detail.